Hell yes, it's about time it's a Robin Miller night. And don't adjust your set, folks, because against all odds, all hell's broke loose here in Charlotte. They've given me this show. So move the women and children to another room because I'm hosting Wind Tunnel tonight. We don't have a teleprompter. We got no parental supervision. We don't have a lot of direction. But what we do have are some really good guests. First up, we've got this old boy with a bit of a reputation. Some call him Super Tex. Others call him the best driver who's ever lived. History books call him the Indianapolis Motor Speedway's first four-time winner. I just call him Henri. Tonight, A.J. Foyt makes his long-awaited wind tunnel debut, which means I'm probably going to have to have my finger in that damn thing all night. But tonight just isn't about a four-wheel legend. We're going to chat up one of motorcycle racing's great characters. Former AMA champ and on any Sunday star, Gene Romero is one of my old buddies from the early 70s. He was a hell of a short track racer on the dirt, and then he became a stud on the pavement. Won the Daytona 200 in 1975. Nowadays, he's a promoter of short track racing in California. He wants to talk about his upcoming race in Pomona, why he's called Burrito, and how many nurses he dated in the 70s. So sit back and enjoy the stories. It's Old School Night on Wind Tunnel. Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is presented by Golden Corral. Okay, folks, I know it's not Dave Despain, it's Robin Miller, but I'm going to have my pen in the ear just like Dave does. I don't sound as good, I don't look as good, but I'm glad to be here, and you are, you're you're going to be glad because we've got A.J. Foyt, Gene Romero, Simona De Silvestro, and if you have any comments or questions, just give us a call, one 866 wtunnel or you can chat us up at speedtv.com. Don't forget, after the show's over, we've got an extra 30 minutes on Wind Tunnel Extra where you can talk to us online for the last 30 minutes. So right now we're going to go to Hot Topics and see what happened in, in racing today. Cup in Kansas today. Chasers claim 10 of the top 11 spots, with Tony Stewart taking two tires on the final stop to get track position and then holding off Jeff Gordon to collect his fourth win of the year and move up to fourth in the standings. Mark Martin still leads Jimmy Johnson by 18 points, while Juan Montoya continues to impress, earning his third top four finish in a row. He's now 51 points behind of the leader in third place. Formula One at the Suzuka Circuit in Japan, where Red Bull's Sebastian Vettel dominated the day to claim his third win of the year, while title rivals Rubens Barrichello and Jensen Button finished seventh and eighth. That means Vettel gained nine points on the leaders with two races remaining. But the big news this week was Ferrari's announcement that they'd signed two-time champ Fernando Alonso to replace departing Kimi Rockinen. Alonso will partner with Felipe Massa next year. No word on where Kimi will go. World of Outlaws at Williams Grove Speedway live on speed last night. 09 Pennsylvania Speed Weeks champ Greg Hodnett continued his good luck in the Keystone State by holding off Donnie Schatz to lead all 40 laps and claiming $50,000 in his first national open win. Shots of title rivals Jason Myers and Joey Saldana were third and seventh. MotoGP in Portugal, where Ducati's Casey Stoner returned in impressive form after a three-race absence for illness. He finished second today behind a dominant Jorge Lorenzo, who trimmed a few points off teammate Valentino Rossi's lead, which is now 18 points with three races to go. Leading into this week's World Superbike event at Magni Corps in France, Yamaha announced they would move Ben Spees to MotoGP a year early making the move next season to team with fellow Texan Colin Edwards at Tech 3 Yamaha, a suggestion our Dave Despain shared several months ago. So, with more pressure for Ben to win the Superbike title this year, Speeds goes out and captures his 13th win of the season in race one over title rival Nori Haga, who then dominates race two, while Speeds can do no better than fourth. Haga takes a 10-point lead in the season finale, which will be in three weeks in Portugal. God, I sounded so professional there. Thank God for tape. All right, there's some other news this week. Nelson Piquet Jr., thrown out of Formula 1, is going to test a camping world truck for Red Horse Racing. Good luck on that. Uh, SI.com today promote, had a story that Rick Hendrick is going to test Danica Patrick and maybe an ARCA car and then run her some nationwide cars. Has nothing been decided that they've just been talking to, to uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s sister, but it's a possibility. And last but not least, Roger Penske said earlier this week he's not going to acquire the Saturn Motor Company from General Motors. Uh, my sources tell me he's just going to go ahead and buy the Annapolis Motor Speedway and the IRL and hire me to run them. So now we're going to have uh, the question of the week. A lot of good drivers out there without rides this week in the, in the whole history of racing. And uh, Kimi Rockinen is the former world champion. He's been cut loose by Ferrari. So our Golden Corral question of the week is this. Now that Kimi Rockinen is rideless for 2010, where is he going to end up? Stay in Formula One? Go to sports cars? You tell me. 
Where will the 2007 F1 champ be next year? Now let's go to the phones, kids. We got line one, Kevin in Cottonwood, Arizona. A good story about Mr. Anthony Joseph Floyd. Go ahead, Kevin. Hey, uh, good to be on. Hey, everybody says AJ's just such a tough old SOB, but uh, last year he sent a great note to a good friend of his in Phoenix, Roxy, on his birthday. Uh, Roxy was with the Clint Bronner and the Dean Van Lines crew back when AJ started. So, uh, AJ, great job remembering one of your old friends. That's not the AJ we usually hear about. Well, good point, Kevin. Because I mean, he's flown. I mean, he took a he took care of Jim Herdebees when he got burned real bad in 1964 at Milwaukee. He took care of George Snyder when he broke his arms. He's done a lot of things behind the scenes that you know you don't know that old crusty tough guy was capable of doing. But there is a heart inside of that body, and it's true. Thanks for the phone call. Thank All you. right, we're going to take a little break here and uh, get back to the. I mean, what you're going to see coming up in the show ought to keep you watching this show. No desperate housewives. Stay right here on Wind Tunnel. Coming up tonight on Wind Tunnel, he's one of the most accomplished and respected racers in motorsports history. From Indy to Le Mans and a lot in between, A.J. Foyt was as versatile a driver as they come. After the break, Robin Miller will begin our in-depth conversation with the outspoken and usually controversial Super Tex. And a little later, can you name the most successful female racer to come out of the Atlantic Championship? If you guessed Danica Patrick or Catherine Legg, you're wrong. After winning four races this year, Simona De Silvestro heads to next week's finale with the points lead and hopes of clinching her first title. She's the focus of this week's Racer Next. Don't go anywhere. We're just getting started. Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is presented by Golden Corral. For around 10 bucks, no place can match Golden Corral's new thrill of the grill. And brought to you in part by Quality Hotels. Rates and rooms to put you at ease. Book at qualityin.com. How about those career stats, folks? 159 wins, 67 IndyCar wins. Nobody will ever touch that record. Seven championships in USAC. First four-time Indy winner. Won the Daytona 500. Probably should have won it two or three times, really. And won Le Mans 24 hours. He won the 24 hours of Daytona. He won the 12 hours of Sebring. He won everything except my heart. But the thing about Foyt that's interesting is he won in midgets. He won in sprint cars. He won in stock cars. He wanted sports cars, and guys could move around then and drive things, and he drove everything you could. But as good as he was on the racetrack, he really became kind of the American favorite because of his personality. He said whatever was on his mind. He didn't. He wasn't afraid to get mad at somebody. He was equal parts kind of like Texas Tornado and all shucks kind of, it's just AJ. But finishing second, finishing second bothered him almost as much as a nosy reporter sticking a microphone in his face. So he clashed with everybody, drivers, sanctioning bodies, media. But... He's a little bit irascible, he's a little bit impossible, he's a little bit incomparable, and he's damn near immortal. He's our hero, Anthony Joseph Foyt Jr. We're thrilled to have him on our guest this wind tunnel night. Hello there, son. How you doing, Robin? Nice seeing you. Oh <laughs> Yeah, I can remember when you put that on your race car and you said, Hey Miller, you always wanted to run an indie, so I'm gonna put a little sticker on my car for you. Well, I, I do it. thank you very much. That's very I I'm touched, as you can tell. Hey, AJ, when... Well, I just wanted to get the story straight before we got started. Well, this is going to be, to be to, to steal one of your lines, to be quite truthful, this is what this is going to be, a great BS session. And I want to start out by saying, right. you came out of midgets, you started when you were 18, with your father, you went to USAC, you went to IMCA, <laughs> but in those days, coroners never trusted kids. The, you know, Bill Vukovic was 30 years old when he came to Indy, Bobby Unser was 32, but in 1958, Al Dean and Clint Bronner, probably one of the best teams there, picked this 23-year-old kid out of Houston, Texas. What made him pick you? Well, I think what made him pick me, actually, uh, Salem, Indiana, a high bank racetrack, and I was driving not too good a car, and fortunate enough, I won the race there, and they always said if somebody run fast on high banks, they'd do pretty good at Indy. So that's how I got picked. AJ, when, when you think about, everybody thinks about your career, Nobody really talks about 
all the guys that you raced with used to tell me he was he was one of the cleanest drivers of all. They all think he was just, is this hard ass guy that raced everybody hard and won to fight and all that. Describe yourself and what your style was and, and what your strengths were as a race driver. Well, I you know I stayed in pretty good shape all my years and I raced very hard and you know if somebody screwed me around on a racetrack I give it right back to them but uh, most of the time everybody run me real fair and I tried to stay fair with them you know. It's just, that's the way racing was back then. You know, it was kind of dangerous if you got upside down. You didn't have all them roll bars and all the stuff to protect you with. You spend a little time in the hospital, and <laughs> every day the nurse come in, you'd say, loosen the bandage a little bit. I think I'm still swelling. So that put pretty good manners on you. <laughs> we just used some of Dick Wallen's great old footage from Langhorn. Why were you so good at Langhorn? It killed a lot of drivers. A lot of good drivers said, I'm not going to run Langhorn. I don't like it. It's too much. You excelled at that place, and it spit a lot of guys out. Well, that's quite true. You had to stay in good shape, and uh, I think one thing, uh, I was in very good shape. I had a very good chief mechanic, and I had a very good car, and we worked closely together, and I just tried to use my head as much as I possible could. Every now and then I'd lose it, but most of the time I tried to use it. AJ, there, there you are going into Pucalo right there, and you look like you went straight instead of going sideways into the ruts. Maybe that's what happened. The other thing was when you started at Indy, you qualified at 143 miles an hour. You ended up at Indy going 225 miles an hour, but there was the three, two, one markers on the front straightaway, and people go, what's that mean? Well, you had to get out of the throttle. Just talk about the, the two different eras and, and which was the toughest thing. Was it much tougher than a Roadster than it was a rear engine car? Oh, about a hundred times more, to be truthful with you. You know, it's just hard to believe. Before I retired, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to run around there wide open. But when my first rookie year, somebody said you'd run around there wide open. It was Conkles Funeral Home over there across the street, and that's where you had wound up over Conkles, because uh, I never thought I'd see the day you could run wide open around there. But when you got a car working real good there, it's really easy to drive. A lot easier than that roaster was, believe me. Tell everybody the story about when you were a rookie in 58 and they wouldn't give you a pit pass. Well, I was a rookie there, and I went in, I'll never forget, uh, to sign in with USAC. And uh, Paul Bain, uh, he told me, he said, look, we don't know who you are, and we really don't care. I said, well, I'm supposed to drive for Dean Van Line. They said, that's the car Jimmy Bryan won the championship in. I said, well, they hired me. He said, until it gets here, you can stay outside. So I had to stay outside the garage here and walk around, and I slept in the back seat of my car and was nervous as hell, to be truthful with you. I said, man, I'll be glad when he gets here. He was about, Clint Bronner was about three or four days late, and my heart was beating, you know, and I couldn't even get a pit pass to go in the pits. It was a lot rougher than it is today. Well, it was also kind of an honor, too, just to get you, take your rookie test back then. It was a big honor, especially, you know, uh, somebody take a chance to give you a, a rookie test. You know, it wasn't like it was today where you had a big money game. It's, you had to prove yourself to get a ride, and if you didn't prove yourself, you just didn't get a ride. All right, sit right there, Tex, because we're going to take a commercial break to pay my big-time salary, and you don't go anywhere because A.J. Foyt's coming back for a lot more fun. Hey, last week we asked you guys to share your favorite A.J. Foyt memories, and we got a whole bunch of them on SpeedTV.com, but here's the sampling of some of them. How about 1983, 24 hours of Daytona, when Bob Wallach turned the car over to A.J. and said, who is this A.J. Foyt guy? Well, then Foyt went out and had the fastest lap, and uh, that comes from Tom. Uh, here's, this, here's the next one. It's difficult for me to decide my favorite A.J. Foyt moment, but here are a few that come to mind. Being pronounced dead at Riverside and recovering to win five races that season. Painting miles of fence in Texas to rehab his arm after a brutal crash at Michigan, then coming back to win the 24 Hours of Daytona, winning Indy for the fourth time, and hitting Robin Miller in 1981. That's from Jim. I'm sure A.J. had you send that in here. Best moment, though, i got to agree. This was my best moment of A.J. Foyt's career. 1965 at the Milwaukee Mile. A.J. took his upright dirt car and set fast time against all the rear engine cars. He finished second, as I remember. More noise than I've ever heard. I had to insert that. He came out of the corners in a four-wheel drift you know, with the front tire lifting, what a show. Plum happy in Florida. Now, Mr. Foyt, we're back to you, sir. Uh, in 1960, you've, you've driven for Aldean. You get a ride suddenly with George Bignati, who's the master mechanic. And in the next six years, you guys win Indy twice. You win 
national titles. You win 27 races. But you quit him halfway through 63. You guys fought like cats and dogs and finally split up in 65. You guys were at each other's throat. Was there just no way to, to, to stay together because you were so successful? Well, I think, George, I respect him highly. He's a very smart mechanic, and I felt like I was a pretty good race driver. You know, it's like a marriage. Sometimes you just have trouble, and I know that year we split up for about three races, and he didn't do no good. I didn't do no good. So the last race, we went back to Sacramento, California. I'll never forget, sit on a pole and, and want it going away. So uh, we did get our marriage back together, and I respect George uh, McNaughty very, very highly because... Uh, you know, without him, there's no telling what I'd done. And I think it was a two-way street. I was good for him, and he was good for me. But you know, it's like a marriage. If if you're real high-strung, you see it today in NASCAR. You see it everywhere. And when you got two high-strung people that both of you want to win, and you know you can win, things start going bad. You're naturally going to be fighting with each other a little bit. But we didn't. It didn't take us too long to get back together. Well, but was it that? Was that? Did that right there? That period of your career convince you you're going to be your own team owner? You weren't going to take orders or sh whatever from anybody else well that's quite true you know i think uh towards we finished up that season and went back in 64 and you know we won i think every race but a couple if i recall but uh all joking aside then after that i decided to go on my own and uh just do it because i was doing a lot of mechanic work you know back in them days you know your mechanic built your motors and built all your cars and i was working right beside big naughty uh after a race, I'd pull a motor out, I'd wash the car, you know, because the money wasn't flowing like it is today because your chief mechanic, and what I'm saying, he'd build the gearboxes, the rear ends, and the motors and all that, where today everything's specialized. This guy's got that job, this guy's got that, and vice versa. But back in them days, you, your chief mechanic, he did everything. Well, but you were such a good driver, but you are also a very good mechanic, a good engine man. Did you resent the fact somebody was trying to tell you how this car was going to operate around the track? Well, I guess so, you know, uh, I had my ways, and uh, I decided <laughs> to try to do it on my own, and uh, anyway, it worked out all right. You know, I ha I've had a lot of fun back in my career, Robin. Uh, if I was born today, I wanted, wanted to be the same way, because back then, it was really, uh, not that it ain't great racing today, it's still a lot of great racing, but I didn't realize how much fun I was having, I <laughs> think, because I'd run, it didn't make no difference if I had to go across the country to run a midget race. I enjoyed it, and I'd run for nothing. I'd run the same for a dollar as I did for a million dollars, and uh, I just loved to race, and that's all I did was eat, sleep, racing, you know. A lot of my friends would fall, well, my wife don't want me to do this. I've got kids and all that. I had a wonderful wife. I still got the same wife. I she's don't know a saint. why she puts up with me, but yeah, I, still, she's... I still I got her, and we've got some wonderful kids, but I never did crawl behind them to hide, you know. Uh, I did my own thing, and I knew my living was racing, and that was it. And uh, that's what I eat and sleep, and I still love racing. Got to be a fool, but I still do. <laughs> that's your words. Hey, in 64, you scored the last victory for the Roadster, the last front engine victory. There was a legend that you tried to get a Lotus Ford that May, and, and you were denied by the people at Ford. And coming down the pit road after you won the Indy 500, you gave the, the single-finger salute to uh, the president of the Ford Motor Company. True or false? Uh, the Texas salute, I give them. The, you know, the one-fingered Texas salute. Yeah, that's right. Is that that's true? That's true. I think it was maybe Lee Iacocca. Yeah. So you probably got, and, and that's what they denied A.J. Foyt using the Lotus Ford. And if you remember, I lapped Ford that day. They run <laughs> second, and I put a lap on them. All right, stay but, right uh, there, stay right know, there. We, we, let, we let bygones be under the bridge. That's right, just like you and me. That's why we're buddies and we're on the same Christmas card every other year. All right, sit right there. It's time for another right. break. We've got a lot left in this edition of Wind Tunnel. Still to come, we've got more with A.J. Foy. As a current IndyCar team owner, what does the series need to get back to prosperity? We'll ask him after the break and find out who he enjoyed smacking the most. Robin Miller or Ari Leyendijk? And from one character to another, we'll check in with former two-wheeled star Gene Romero. Back in the 70s, he was known as the Burrito. Today, he's known as Series Promoter. He'll tell us all about that coming up. Stay tuned. Wind Tunnel will be right back. 
See that right there? I'm keeping an eye on AJ. That was a couple weeks after he smacked me in 1981. Now, tell the truth there, Henri. Did you have more fun smacking me out in front of the grandstand at 81 or smacking Lion Dyke? Because I know you enjoyed both of them, and don't lie. Well, I guess you got to tell a little white lie. I wasn't proud of myself either way because I lost the fight going home with my wife. So I lost that fight. She didn't. We had uh, Larry Foyt was in <laughs> TCU there at Texas, and uh, people called in and said it's like old Saturday night racing. So that wasn't very good what A.J. Foyt did. And I've grown up since then, uh, Robin. Well, I know that, and, and now I can outrun you, so I'm not scared of you anymore. All right, we want to have a few more favorite A.J. Foyt memories. Here's an email. By far, 1982, when Kevin Cogan caused that big crash at the start, A.J. got smacked in the front wheel, which set his car's tow way off. He jumped out of the car, fixed it himself, adjusted it by his eyeball, then went out. I think he led the next 35 laps when the race restarted. Nathan Jones, I was just adding to your... And then there we got another one. My favorite A.J. Foyt moment came at Indy when A.J. grabbed a laptop computer off the pit box and slammed it down after leading the race. The crew members had calculated they had enough fuel, and they didn't. Running out. John of Indy. All right, now... My first question to you is, one of the great things that has endeared you to people over the years is, is some of the things you've said. And, and, and right off the bat, I can just think of that damn Coogan when Chris Economac, after you, after you got crashed at the start of the 82 race and you were storming back to the pits, and he said, what happened, A.J.? You said, hit me to the left front. Who hit you enough? A damn Coogan. So we called Kevin Coogan Coogan the rest of his life. But uh, I think probably you remember that as one of the fun times of uh, Indy because you got the car going real good right after that crash. Well, to be truthful with you, you know, Penske cars on the front row and I was on the outside and everybody thought Penske cars would lead the first lap and there's a lot of pretty good sized money being bet on that first lap and I had a good friend of mine that morning of the race that bet some pretty good mega bucks, which he's deceased now. I said, don't worry, I can handle them the first few laps. And uh, that's actually what the whole deal was about. And then he ran out of brains and at the start of the race <laughs> broke it loose. And uh, I was sitting there and then I've got and my good friend Andretti come flying up there and really crowds the hell of a bang. <laughs> you know, he's kind of jumping the start. So uh, all in all, it worked out good. And we led it till we made the pit stop and uh, all my friends won their money. And that was the biggest thing. And, but I was going down the back straight. I'll be truthful with you. I, I knew I lined it up, I thought, pretty good by eyeballing it. And Jack, my chief mechanic, Jack Starnes, run back and took another part off the other car, and we just bolted it on there. I went through one and went through two, and going down the back tree, I said, man, what's this damn thing going to do when I turn into three? But it worked out good. So uh, all my friends made a little bit of money, and if you recall, when I come in the pit stop, it hung in gear, and I had to work on it with a little hammer. I got out. and. It didn't help things, but uh, we had some gearbox problems. That was another great moment in sports. I was sitting next to Robin Hurd in 87 or 88. You were driving a march. You lost four or five miles an hour in a four-lap qualifying run. You got out. Poor old Jim Fellopy, who's no with us. He's not with us anymore. He sat down, and he had to interview you afterwards, and he goes, AJ, it looked like you had a little problem out there. Uh, can you tell us what happened? And, of course, you, you being AJ Foyt, said, well, to be quite truthful with you, this car is just a tub of crap. Of course, you didn't say crap. You said that on the You're PA. Right. You said that on the PA system. Two hundred thousand people cheered. National TV loved it. All the media loved it. And I'm sitting next to Robin Hurd, and I said, "Don't worry, the king of racing just badmouthed your car." And then, of course, I referred to it as TOS March the rest of the year in the Indianapolis Star or the rest of the month. And you kept saying, "Why is he putting TOS behind that?" Well, that's quite true. That's the reason I love you so much, Robin. You do <laughs> tell the truth every now and then. Uh, more than every now and then. Hey, let's talk about. When, when Jimmy Clark and the boys came over, you had a high regard for Jimmy Clark. You always said that. But it was, it was great because it was the foreign rear engine invasion against A.J. Foyt, Parnelli Jones, and Don Branson, Lloyd Ruby, Jim Herdebees. It was the Americans versus the foreigners. And, and you had another great line. When you won the poll in 65, you said, well, it's about damn time I brought this back to the USA. <laughs> well, that's quite true. I was very happy that day. It's after I got injured pretty bad in a NASCAR accident, remember it? Riverside, California, broke my leg and broke my back and pulled my breastbone apart. And actually, that was my first race back. And he set the track record, and I followed him out. And I broke the track record again. And like I said, I was glad to bring it back to the USA. All right. Sit tight, Mr. Foyt. We're not done with you. We, we got about, uh, oh, I don't know, 50 or 60 more emails and about 10 more phone calls. And I'm going to grill you about you and Smokey Eunuch. 
So a few people, you see that right there? That's Parnelli Jones and A.J. Foyt at Salem going sideways. That's A.J. Foyt on the cushion. Parnelli Jones at Terre Haute when men were men. Some more of the best of A.J. Foyt, and there was a lot of those. Let's take a phone call from Craig, from Travis in Craig, Colorado, who's got a question for Anthony Joseph. Fire away, Craig. Or Travis, yeah. sorry. Yeah, uh, with so many achievements in your career, A.J., um, what kind of things in this era impress you as far as racing achievements? Well, actually, well, Tony Sherry sure impressed me pretty good today. He looked pretty good, that 14 going to victory circle. <laughs> you know, Stuart... Obviously, we should tell. I mean, I think everybody knows that follows racing. Stuart used 14 because A.J. was his hero growing up. Um, but we got another question that kind of leads into all this. It, it's an email. Sorry. It says, A.J., what do you think of today's modern prima donnas compared to the gritty balls-to-the-wall type drivers of your era? Adam. Well, actually, you know, in my era and era today, it's pretty much the same. You're always going to have crybabies, and some of them, they go back to mama. So you got the same thing back years back in the 60s you do today. I mean, it might have been a little bit harder then, but uh, today the money's a hell of a lot better, so it makes it a lot easier. But uh, all in all, I, I think you got some great, great guys out there racing today, and the same deal had 19 in the 60s. Uh, you had some great guys. You know, of course, I think back in the 60s, a few of them, you know, lost their lives more than they are today. But, uh, you know, through the years, that's one thing that's happened with racing. You know, NASCAR, and USAC, RL, they do everything to make it safer for the drivers. And that's one thing I'm awful glad to see happen in racing because every time before, you know, we crashed the Indy car, blew up and caught fire. Today, you very seldom see a fire unless you screw up like we did this year at Indy with Vitro. We had a hell of a fire. So uh, it can still happen, but it's normally your fault when it happens. So that's the biggest thing about racing today. It's so much safer today than it was in the 60s. Well, I mean, nobody got hurt more than you did. You broke your leg and got run over by a dirt car. You had a really bad fire at, at, at Milwaukee and had to push your hand in the fire to get out of it. You had the terrible crash at Elkhart Lake, I think, in 91, where you shattered your feet. You broke your back, and they thought you were dead at Riverside in a stock car. You got attacked by killer bees. You fell off. Your bulldozer fell in the lake, and you almost got drowned and eaten by a snake. What? What? Tell us what the worst injury of all is. All of them was bad, Robin. I'll be truthful <laughs> with you. That's the reason you see me fat and crippled today. But you know, you did forget one thing. Decoin, when that damn lion jumped on my back when I tried to run, and he broke loose and he took me down in the infield, Decoin, Illinois. I'll never forget that. <laughs> And I'd guess uh, the worst thing was, though, when the dozer went over backwards in the water because uh, I thought I was going to see the undertaker right then, to be truthful with you. Everybody wanted to know how I got out. I said, I wasn't hooting any. I need some damn air and air quick. But uh, also, I got corrected a while ago by Ann Fernaro that keeps all our records that uh, Indy was the second pole earlier that year. It was my first race. I sat on the pole at uh, Phoenix, Arizona, so I, I did have to make that correction. That's what a good PR woman does. Hey, let's go to today's racing. What's wrong with IndyCar? What does it need to get back on the, to get back on the radar with the American public? Well, to be truthful with you, it's been awful close racing, good racing. I just don't think they're getting the exposure they really need. I mean, the race in the last couple of years has been very, very good, but uh, you need some different winners up there, and that's what we're working hard to, to do for next year. You know, we thought we had a good year going this year, and everything went to hell at Indy race day, and, you know, and we just ha have never recovered. But uh, that's the biggest thing, you know, you need uh, just some different winners. I mean, it's been very good racing, very close racing, very fast racing, but... You know, you got some of the old teams that's been out there still got the old bulldogs behind that steering wheel, and hell, they're hard to beat. <laughs> All right, sit still. We're not done with you yet. But coming up, we got... <clears throat> what?
Coming up, can Simona De Silvestro hold on to her seven-point lead to become the first woman to win the Atlantic Championship? She certainly hopes so. We'll talk to her about her season and future in the sport a little later. But up first, what's it take to slide a powerful and almost out-of-control motorcycle around a flat dirt track? 1970 champion and current race promoter Gene Romero will join us to talk about one of the underappreciated but very cool forms of American motorsport. Stick around. We'll be back after this short break. This week's Golden Corral Help Yourself to Happiness moment focuses on Joey Logano, who didn't let his spectacular crash at Dover last week ruin his appetite. He was so hungry to put that experience behind him, he went out and won the very next race, passing his dominant teammate Kyle Busch with just three laps to go to win Saturday's nationwide event in Kansas, his fourth win of the season. All right, this is our last segment with Mr. Foyt. We're going to try and get as many questions as we can to him. AJ, you've had everybody from Bill Vukovic to Chip Ganassi to Tim Richmond to Kenny Brack driving for you. Who was your favorite driver that you hired? Kenny Brack, I'd have to say, was one of my favorite drivers. Even though you thought he was a surfer from California, he was actually from Sweden. Yeah, he was a foreigner. <laughs> he was one of them damn foreigners, Robin. All right, who is your least favorite driver? And I know the answer, I bet. Well, the one I caught, could have probably killed two or three times was Eddie Cheever. Yeah, and if Eddie, if you'd have killed Eddie Cheever, you you would have probably gone up even higher in the racing community's estimation. Okay, you let Janet Guthrie drive your car in 1976 on practice morning. Why? Well, Mr. Holman asked me to do that, and then when she was out there running, they turned the yellow on. My heart quit beating because that was my backup car, <laughs> but Janet Guthrie was a great race driver. Well, great. You're politically correct. She wasn't great, but she was okay. All right. Why do you call your cars coyotes? Well, the gurney built the eagle, so I had to have a coyote to chase them and try to eat them up. And, and because it was, you told me the other day, because a coyote was wild, what? right? Like you. Wild oh, man. Oh, yeah. It was wild. Well, yeah. No, like you. No, I'm not wild. All right. Who did you respect the most when you raced in the 60s, when you had all the badasses? Well, I'd have to take my hat off to Pernelli Jones and also Roger Ward. You know, Roger Ward was on his way out, but he was tough. Okay. Are there, any, are there any of these mama's boys in auto racing today, could they have cut it in the 60s? I'm quite sure there are. There's a few of them that could cut it in the 60s. <laughs> well, name one of them. Tony Stewart or Jeff Gordon. Okay. What about anybody in the IRL? Would you take back to the 60s with you? Maybe Paul Tracy? He wouldn't have lived very long, but he'd have been spectacular. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're making some awful damn hard decisions for me to answer. I'd have to sit there and study and look at it pretty close to, be, to give you an honest answer. All right. This is from Gordon Johncock. Final question. Who was the best cheater, you or Smokey Eunuch? Smokey Unit is pretty damn good. I drove for Smokey. He was a super friend of mine, and uh, let's face it, he had some awful power from stock cars when I drove them. All right. Hey, we appreciate you spending a half an hour with us. I tell you what, uh, I can't believe you've been this patient for me, and now I'm going to owe you for the rest of my life. It's going to be painful, but I can afford brownies, just not steaks. We'll see you in Homestead this week, and uh, hopefully Ryan Hunter Ray can do a good job for you. Thanks again, AJ. Thank you. I'd like to wish you Merry Christmas in case you don't make it. <laughs> that, that's me and Mario. That was 1964. <laughs> See ya. Roger. Up next, we're going to talk to one of my favorite motorcycle racers of all time, Gene Romero, right there on the dirt going sideways. He'll join us after the break. Don't go anywhere. Some awesome footage from Bruce Brown's On Any Sunday, one of the greatest movies you'll ever see. Steve McQueen's in it, our hero Gene Romero's in it. Now, I first met Gene Romero, a.k.a. Burrito, in 1969 when he was barnstorming across the AMA circuit with David Aldana, John Hately, Chuck Pomgren, David Aldana, Frank Gillespie. Uh, 
Sam Peckinpah made a movie once called The Wild Bunch. That's what these guys were. They lived in their vans. Everything they owned were in their vans. They lived race to race. They didn't care about anything but the next race and having fun. And we welcome Gene Romero to the show right now. And Burrito, when you guys were in the 60s and 70s going up and down the road trying to figure out where your next meal was, did you realize how what a great life it was or did it hit you later in life? Oh, no. It, it, it happened at the very beginning. As soon as we were leaving California and we'd have everything in our truck, it, it was like we, we knew we were going to have a good time. We just, know, we just didn't know what it was. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I had a mechanic working for me at the time, Nick the Greek, and great guy. And I told him, I said, when we go on the road, something's going to happen. And when you come back home and you tell your friends, they're not going to believe you. And he said, well, what, what, what's, what is it going to be? And I said, I can't tell you because I don't know. <laughs> well, we got back home a month later, and he, said, he came up to me, and he said, they don't believe me. And, and it was just a real good time. And, and when I knew that we were having a good time, and I capitalized on it. And, and uh, it, was just a, it was just a special time, a, a special era, and it was a lot of fun. Gino, when I was at uh, the Indy Mile once with, with our old buddy, the late Jimmy Carruthers, Indy 500 driver, we're standing on top yeah. of the administration building in turn one watching you guys. It was probably the first time everybody saw the mile. Six guys came over the start-finish yeah. line. Well, a blanket got thrown over them. You didn't know who won. Carruthers looked at me, put his cigarette out, and he says, if they ever discover this sport, we're out of business because nobody will watch our stuff. That's the most exciting thing I've ever seen. It is the most exciting race that I've ever seen. Why didn't it catch on with the general public? Well, I think it was the, the leadership uh, back in that day, and, and, and what we need to do is get on the tube naturally. And, and, uh, and the people that you know, kind of ran the organization, and that, they, that wasn't their forte. It wasn't quite like the automobiles. And, and, then, and then naturally the financing in those days to get up on TV and that. But uh, no, I mean, Jimmy, what a wonderful guy, man. I, I mean, he wasn't a friend. He was my brother. And, yeah. uh, uh, and I'll never forget, he'd always go down the first corner there with uh, JP and the different guys, and they'd just come back and say, you guys are nuts. And then we'd go to Indy and go to the first corner and tell them that they were nuts. So, I mean, it was a fun time. Okay, you, you're in Sedalia, Missouri one year, and you're getting ready to go out and hot lap, but the track's got all kinds of ruts and stuff, and so it's time for hot laps, and uh -oh. you stand up and you tell the AMA yep. steward, no chance I'm going out there. Send out the novices. They're expendable. And one of those guys you pointed to is this guy named Dave Despain. Do you remember the tallest AMA short tracker of all time? I, I remember that day, and believe me, uh, Dave has not let me, uh, uh, has not forgot that. And every time I see him, he brings that up. And God, uh, I remember, you know, we, we, we ran uh, Indianapolis on Saturday night, and then we drive all night, and we get there, and the, the, the official was a guy named, we used to call him Macaroni. And uh, he was quite the character. And, and anyhow, at the writer's meeting, he said, hey, it's really rough out there. And it was Chuck and I and a few of the guys. And we said, well, hell, just send out the novices. They're expendable. <laughs> and to this day, Dave has not let me forget that. <laughs> Gino, you started a circuit called the West Coast Flat Trackers about 12 years ago. Tell us about this race coming up at Pomona at the end of the month. Oh. You got about 40 seconds. Well, at the end of the month. Okay, at the end of the month, on October the 24th, uh, we're having this big race at the Pomona. And what's, uh, what's amazing is AMA Pro Racing, they've been absent from Southern California for 10 years, and they have joined forces with us, and we're putting on one heck of an event. They're going to crown their Grand National Champion there uh, on Saturday night, along with the West Coast Flat Track Series. We're going to be crowning our Top Gun Champion and our, and our uh, k and Open uh, Champion. Along with that, we're going to have the Saddleman Vintage Races. So. We're going to have four classes, and this is the first time that this has ever been done, and it's on a 5 8 mile cushion, and, it, and the cushion's kind of like the Indianapolis mile, but uh, it, it's, it's even a little bit looser, and it puts on a great show, and it's part of the California Bike Week, which will, will take place from the 23rd to the 25th, and, uh, and, and then the day after will be the Love Ride, the 26th annual Love Ride there, and uh, I'd just like to thank all the Southern California Harley-Davidson dealers for making this happen and giving us the opportunity to put on this great event. And I look forward to the AMA being there and the West Coast Flat Track Series. It's going to be a great event. We appreciate your time. You're looking good for an old guy. Thanks for the memories on any uh, Sunday. And good luck with the race in a couple of weeks, Gino. Okay. And, Robin, please say hi to the gang back there at Indy. And, and thank you for my, very much for letting us on. Thank you. Our pleasure. Now, don't forget, we got another 30 minutes of wind tunnel over at speedtv.com. 
coming up at 10 o'clock, and I need some of you people to call in there. Next is Eye Candy and Racer. Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is presented by Golden Corral. For around 10 bucks, no place can match Golden Corral's new thrill of the grill. In this week's Race Your Next segment, we're going to focus on current Atlantic Point leader, Simona Di Silvestro, the pride of Switzerland. She's had 35 starts in three years, five victories, 10 podiums, four pole positions. Right now, she's leading Jonathan Summerton by seven points with one race to go next weekend at Laguna Seca. She's one of one, only two women to win a race in the Atlantic Series. It's a 36-year-old series, one of the great proving grounds. We welcome Simona. I know she's now sunbathing right now in beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona. How are you doing, kid? Thanks for having me. I'm doing pretty well. Now, I remember when you were a rookie with Derek Walker three years ago, and you had some good runs, and I said, what do you think? And he said, you know, he said, I think she just needs laps. Well, last year you won your first race at Long Beach. This year you got four victories. Gerald Tyler's your engineer. Just talk about your progression. Oh, yeah. I started uh, uh, with Walker Racing so three years ago, and, uh, you know, it was uh, kind of a, a big step coming from a former BMW into the Atlantic car. Uh, you know, the field is really tough in the Atlantic Series, so um, it took me a little bit, uh, a while to learn, and, um, but I think uh, I really grew over the years, uh, especially last year we went into the first race in, uh, in Long Beach, and uh, I won it, so uh, that was a pretty great accomplishment, but uh, then we had a little bit of bad luck uh, during the whole season, so, um, you know, uh, but this year I've been uh, really fortunate, you know, like, uh, with the uh, Stargate Worlds behind me, they, they put a great program behind me uh, and Frankie. So um, uh, I'm really thankful to them to give me this opportunity. And uh, we went into this championship to win it. So um, uh, it's going pretty well until now. So I really have to thank, you know, uh, everybody. Even, uh, you know, my engineer is Burke Harrison and, and Gerald is on Frankie's car. So <laughs> uh, they both are, are really good engin engineers. So that helps a lot. How have you been at Laguna before? That's where the final race is. Have you had success there before? Do you like the track? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's funny. Um, uh, my dad bought a, a video game a few years back, and that, that Laguna Seca was the first track I've ever driven on a on a simulator. So um, uh, I'm really looking forward to go there. We drove there last year, and uh, I had an okay result, a bit of bad luck, but uh, I'm really looking forward to that track. It's a, it's a lot of, a lot of fun to drive there. What about next year? You've been in this series three years. You've shown you can win races. Three years is a long time to be in a feeder system. Do you want to be in Indy cars next year? Do you want to go back to Europe? What's your plan? Well, uh, for the moment, we really concentrated on on this last race. You know, uh, I think a lot is going to depend if uh, win this championship or not. So, um, my dream has always been to go to Formula One. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm really working very hard to to achieve my dream. So, I, I don't know if uh, uh, next year I'm going to stay in the U.S. or going back to Europe. But um, I hope to stay in open wheel for sure. All right, well, good luck this weekend racing against Jonathan Summerton and John Edwards, two young American stars, and it's going to be the pride of Switzerland, and we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks to A.J. Foyt, thanks to Gene Romero, thanks to Simona, thanks to Dave Spain and Andy for letting me do this show. We'll see you in about five seconds in Wind Tunnel Extra. Remember, send in some questions because i got to spend 30 more minutes here, gang. <laughs>